All right. So next, Renegade Con. Uh, technically, Renegade Con virtual. Renegade Con colon virtual. I, I, I couldn't figure out what exactly they wanted to tell you to call it, but that's what it was it, in their logos. It says Renegade Con virtual. Uh, this was an online gaming convention put on by Renegade Game Studios. Uh, this la ran last Friday to Sunday. Uh, included pretty much all the things you'd expect at a physical con. Uh, there was an online store, which you could go and shop, uh, that even had con-exclusive promos, um, which was pretty cool. There were multiple game tournaments, including a huge, like, worldwide um, Raiders of the North Sea tournament with one of the sweetest-looking trophies I've ever seen. There were demo rooms. Uh, there were interviews you could watch. You could attend workshops, which, uh, interesting enough, like, had a list of what tools you would need to bring for the workshops. There were panels. And there was, like, even a lobby where you could just, like, hang out and chat and hang out with other people uh, uh, talking Renegade games. Well, a, small, a tall task to take on, and one more and more organizations are being forced to learn without the kind technical support and infrastructure something like this would have had available to it in the past i gotta say this is not something i could have seen working five years ago it would have been rough though i know there have been online cons this is by far not the first online con aether con i think it's been around for 10 years so it's not the first thing google hangouts used to be a big part of it now for this uh, Discord was was the the hub. I, I would consider it the, the hall. The main hall was Discord. That's where all the gathering was, the lobby, uh, discussions on various Renegade games. They each had their own little chat room. Uh, there were also waiting rooms for the various demos there. Now, the demos themselves all used Tabletopia, which was a sponsor for the event. Uh, I guess Renegade and Tabletopia really worked closely together to get these games up on Tabletopia. Um, and what's interesting is they're gone now. They were up literally on Tabletopia for this con only, and they will be back for future online cons that Renegade's taking part in. So they had demos of Warp's Edge, Succulent, Space Battle Lunchtime, and Search for Planet X. And I would love to tell you about those, but I have to admit, I did not actually take part in any demos myself. As we've said, Tabletopia can be a, a bit of a resource hog for older or slower computers, but when you can see it, it is a really great way to display it. Yeah. Now, along with the demos, uh, there were various timed RPG events. I mean, like, they had time slots, like, at a normal con. Uh, these also used Discord for the waiting rooms and the chat, but they used Roll20 for the actual gameplay, the actual maps, character sheets, and stuff like that. Uh, games on offer included Altered Carbon, Icarus, Kids on Bikes, Junior Braves, Outbreak Undead, Overlight, Teams in Space, Wardlings, and the very hot and popular and just announced Kids on Brooms, a, a new evolution of Kids on Bikes, uh, obviously bringing into mind a certain wizarding world. Well, I did sit in on part of a session, a session of Altered Carbon. I didn't actually play in any of these games. Now, I have to say, just the fact that you can sit in on sessions of games, really nice, to be honest. Uh, it's a great way to get a feel for a game uh, without maybe being uncomfortable sitting down with a, you know, a, a, a random group of people. But you know, it's always great at these cons if you can get to experience something uh, and a new game that you might want to bring back to your group uh, without necessarily, you know, sitting in and getting the full player involvement. One tech tip or one tip that I made the mistake of is mute your mic before joining a game in progress. <laughs> I learned that one. I got, I got a lot of shouts at, at me and I, I had to apologize for that one. I didn't even realize it because my mic was just literally like sitting off in the corner of the room. But in Discord, when you join a voice room, it automatically turns on your mic. So mute your mic before joining a game. So I got to admit it, I, I didn't play games at this con, but I did kind of check out the tech and what they're doing. But what I did do is I joined in on a variety of uh, workshops, panels, and interviews. So one of the things they did that I actually thought was kind of brilliant is they split up the types of content on different online platforms. So like all of the workshops were on Twitch. So if you went to Renegade's Twitch, actually they had a specific, yeah, Renegade's Twitch. It was just play Renegade's Twitch. And that was all your workshops. All the panels were on YouTube under a specific channel they created just for the con called Renegade Con. Uh, and then the interviews were, I guess, on Facebook Live, though you could also see them on YouTube. So I think they just did the, like the sharing thing. Uh, now, what I didn't like is that many of these overlapped. 
Now, that did very much give me that feel of being at a con going, well, I want to go to this panel, but this interview is at the same time. So I definitely had that problem. Um, it just kind of bugged me because I would be sitting there, uh, saying, sitting on a panel, listening to Banana Chan talk about world building and big adventures, and all of a sudden a notice would pop up saying, the panel on Gaming With Your Kids is starting now. And I'm like, but, but Banana Chan's talking. So I tried to do the two monitor thing and keep both on at once, and no, I'm not Sean. I know Sean has like multiple audio going on. I, I, that didn't work for me. I unfortunately, I couldn't listen to two different live streams at once. I wasn't capable. Now, on a positive note, all of these, every single interview, panel, and workshop is going to be released on video on demand. So I will eventually get to catch up on what I missed. Con FOMO is real, even at a digital con. Like, I, part of me was like, come on, you guys run the con just to stagger them. But I think they just wanted to get all the content in, right? There just weren't enough hours in the day to get everything in. But I was like, oh, come on, you're all renegade. Like, can't you just, like, push everything by half an hour? It was a little, a little frustrating, but like I said, you know what? It felt like a con. The fact I'm going to be able to go and watch all this later is great, right? Like, I, I won't have actually missed anything. So this is what I actually did. I, I spent the weekend working. This is what I do. I sit at this computer and work most of the time. So I sat at the computer working, and while I was working, I have two monitors, and I had one monitor over here with Twitch, and I had one tab over here with YouTube, and I would swap them depending on what I wanted to watch and one would be muted and the other wouldn't. And that's literally what I did is I always had one of the two going, which was kind of cool. And there was almost no time where there was nothing happening. So because of this, I attended a ton of like panels and workshops over the weekend. Yeah. And unfortunately, because it was just an online con, I was unable to get away and really take the time to participate this way uh, this weekend, the way I might, if I actually went to a con and yeah. you know, left and didn't have laundry and kids and, and all the associated mm -hmm. distractions uh, that, uh, that, that come from working at home. Yeah, there were, there were definitely things like there was, I forget what it was, but I'm like, I want to be back by five, four X. And I didn't get back by five. Like I, I'm at home. I got busy doing other things. Yep. Um, now what I will say is I was very impressed by the quality. Now, I mean both the quality of the the look and the feel, the technical side of things, like the the way they presented things, the, the the graphics, the transitions, the presentation was excellent, but even more so the quality of the topic and speakers. Like this was an amazingly diverse and talented group of people that were at this convention taking part. Like some of the biggest names in the hobby were there. Now, I don't have the time, or you don't have the time. I don't want to make this a four-hour episode. Usually our con wrap-ups are a full episode, and I probably could have. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything here, but just this is some of the highlights of what I attended. Now, one of the best and most enjoyable to watch, and this is one like watch for it when Renegade puts this out on video on demand, is the Concept to Cardboard. Uh, this was a panel. It was moderated by Mandy Hutchinson, uh, featured Quan Chai Moria, The Miko, Eric Hibbler, and Anita Osborne, and they were talking about creating art and board games. And I got to say what shocked me is two of the big names on that panel don't play board games at all, uh, like at all. Uh, the Miko in particular doesn't play board games and was talking about how they now have one of the largest board game collections in the place where he lives, which I'm sorry, I didn't note that down. And he was showing off the games and it's because it's all the production copies he gets for being the artist on them. And they were all in shrink. Like he just doesn't play board games. I just would have, I don't know, like in my head, I was just like, well, if you draw art for board games, obviously play board games. The other thing though is Miko is amazingly hilarious. Like if you if if, if you ever hear Miko is going to be on a podcast or he's going to be on a live show, just check it out just to listen to this man. He is hilarious. Yeah, I have to say this didn't actually surprise me as much as it seemed yeah. to surprise you. Personally, I don't see any problem with an artist filling their portfolio with things they don't take part in. Uh, as long as uh, what this what this really actually says though is the importance of a detailed spec when yeah. you are creating a game. If you are able to adequately describe your needs to an artist, they don't need to know what the board how to play the board game. They just need to make sure that their art, which you obviously like if you're giving mm -hmm. them the spec, uh, you know fits exactly what your requirements are, and you're good. 
No, I was. I didn't have a problem with it. I don't. I don't mean it that way. It just oh, no. seemed. I, I don't. It just surprised me. <laughs> like I just assumed that like the person would be like, "Look, at this is my like." I, I have to assume there's Magic the Gathering artists out there that never played Magic the Gathering, and it just. I don't know. My brain never put that together. Right. It makes sense. It yep. makes total sense. So another panel, and uh, I bring this one up for a unique reason because I don't actually own the game that it was about, and this was the Power Rangers um, Defense of the Grid. I think it's called something the grid i apologize for not having the full name here but it was a power rangers panel that talked about what went into making this game and importantly what goes into making a game series because this was meant to be bigger than just one game defenders of the grid thank you ryan in the chat room power rangers defenders of the grid and this was fascinating like they had a lot of big names in here this was hosted by terry latorco uh featured jonathan yang who's the lead developer on the game dan bojanowski who is a uh, behind the scenes um uh, the the spreadsheet guy, right? The guy in the back that does all the math. He was pointing out things like every time they'd want to change the size of the miniature, they'd have to go to Dan, and Dan would have to let them know if it's possible in the current box size, and if it wasn't, how that would impact their cost. And then uh, Jan Torres, who was the the graphic designer for all of Renegade, she is in charge of the entire graphic design of all of Renegade's games. And her a lot of her talk was about the unified look and things they did to make it like she had to redesign the lightning bolt for Power Rangers, right? Like they. Like, it has to have a lightning bolt because Power Rangers needs a lightning bolt. What's the Renegade lightning bolt look like? Like, this was just, there was a huge amount of sausage making. And it was totally fascinating. And I don't own the game. Like, I just happened to put that one on. And I'm like, that was a fantastic panel. Yeah, and uh, it's actually uh, Heroes of the Grid, apparently, is the 2019 version. Okay. The grid apparently comes up a lot in Power Rangers. I'm not I, a real Power yeah. Rangers person, but if you search Power Rangers grid, like 15 different titles of shows okay, and, and, and fan fandom and things show up. So apparently the grid is part of... There you uh, go. Power Rangers I, Heroes of the Grid? Heroes of the Grid, yeah. There we go. Okay. So uh, it's intriguing how big Power Rangers is again right now uh, because uh, it seems to have made another resurgence, even though the movie was three years ago. Um, it's, 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 it still keeps coming back. And I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just the whole thing. Like we had when we were kids, we had it. Now the people who had it are now adults with, with disposable income yeah, right. and are getting back into it. I don't know. I, I, I have a friend, my friend, Mike is a huge power Rangers fan. He, I'm, I, I don't, I doubt he knows this even exists. Cause while Mike does play board games, he usually learns them about them from me. So Mike is a huge fan. I got to admit by the time this panel finished, I wanted to buy the game. Like I'm like, Oh, this looks awesome. It's it's an eight two on BG. Uh, it looks good. It, it I gotta admit it looks good. I, and like I said, like hearing the sausage making made me want it even more. Uh, another one I attended, just an interview. I I watched an interview with Jonathan Gilmore. That was pretty cool. Um, mainly talking about his RPG side, and I didn't even know Jonathan Gilmore did RPGs. So like he's he's the man behind Kids on Bikes. I know him from it's not Renegade, so I think they didn't want to bring it up. But I know him from some of his work on um, Dinosaur Island, for example, or board games. Uh, I checked out a panel about designing unique RPGs. That was really good. Like just talking about doing something different. Uh, it was moderated by Victoria Rogers. Uh, fe featured Spencer Starkey, Doug Lewandowski, uh, Cleo Yun Sun Davis, and Christopher De La Rosa. Um, that one was really good. Like just fantastic panels. Like the the diversity in the group and the di diversity of views was fantastic. But overall, the best panel I attended for for my own personal sake that that I not even necessarily enjoyed the most, but found the most information on was uh, behind the scenes of game development. Uh, this was hosted by Sarah Erickson, featured Dan Bojanowski, Matt Riddle, Ben Pinchback, Paul Denon, and Shem Phillips. And what I liked about this is it was a lot of talk about the difference between design and development and how those are two separate things. And the thing it taught me that was important to me was I always assumed if you want to be a game developer, now a game developer is someone who iterates, who fixes the rules, who streamlines, who who almost a game editor in a way, but through mechanics, through play testing. I always assumed you had to be a designer to become a developer. Like I just assumed you would have had to have designed a game at some point to be able to prove your worth as a developer. And sure enough, Dan has never designed a game and has no interest to. He likes to, other people give him the, here it is, it's half built, 
fix it, finish it, right? Like he gets the half built Lego and finishes off the castle, right? And I just thought that was fascinating. Like just a, a great, again, what was really nice is seeing Renegade's side and how it changes where sometimes a designer will go to them and hand over a game and it's done. And then Renegade develops it and produces it and everything else. And the designer hands it off. And sometimes it becomes almost a totally different game. Uh, interestingly enough, oh, I forget the name of it. And it was one of the ones that were demos. Uh, the one about astronomy from Renegade, I'm totally forgetting the name, uh, was originally a game about lighthouses. And the lighthouses of northern Michigan, to be honest. Um, and they completely changed it. But that was one where the developers worked with... Um, I don't know, was Matt and and Ben? Is that Stellar you're talking about? Yes, yeah, Stellar. Yes, yeah, Stellar was originally about lighthouses. Um, I think it was Matt and Ben. Um, worked with them all the way through. Like yeah. obviously Matt and Matt Ben. And ben were the the Matt and Ben are the designers. Yeah, they're the designers of it. Um, they are the people. The 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 game I love by them is Fleet, and which again has lighthouses. So I think they just they, they're <laughs> they like the upper the upper the upper peninsula of uh, camping up north in Michigan and the red and white striped lighthouses are obviously a thing for them because there's some involved in fleet. But they were directly involved with every step of it, including the development. And I guess there was very little development, but that depends on how much of a finished product was handed over. But anyway, I'm kind of going on about this more than I plan to. But that one was really cool. Like I, I dig that. If I could get a job in the board game industry that's not just content creating and reviewing, I think development would be awesome. Playtesting and development really interests me. And it was cool to see the, the different ways you can get into that. And there were more. Like, this is just like a handful. Like I said, I couldn't even tell you how many I attended. I think there were 12 different panels and eight different workshops. Excuse me. I think there were 12 different panels, eight different workshops. Right now at renegade.com is a good summary of everything they did. So, yeah, it's great to see that the industry hasn't just thrown their hands up and said, well, what are we supposed to do? There's a pandemic. Uh, instead, yeah. they've stepped up and made the cons happen. Now, it's different. And while a lot of people will say, oh, but there have been online cons for ages and ages, I think we're seeing a real evolution. Yes. Uh, the, the variety of solutions all being brought together. Um, and so you've got this coordination, whereas you in the past, you know, if you wanted to go to a Renegade Con, you'd go to renegadecon.com and everything would be there. You'd, you'd be there. Uh, in this day and age, that's not a feasible solution. Yeah. So you're seeing, you know, Roll20 and Tabletopia and Twitch and YouTube mm -hmm. and Facebook and everyone coming together and all these different solutions being brought to fo focus, you know, and, and whether Discord is their hub or whatever they choose, um, they're distributing the processing because you can't have that quantity of content on one website right now mm -hmm. uh, the, the infrastructure doesn't work uh and so the distribution a fantastic way to make these cons really stand out now i gotta say when i first heard about this online convention and other online gaming conventions especially the the plethora of them the of them that have been announced this year because of of covid and not meeting in person i was skeptical like like really skeptical like almost enough that i didn't even bother checking them out like i i didn't think that it was going to work really to be honest like yeah you can go online and play games like i do it i play on board game arena all the time we play on yukata that's what i pictured was why would I go to an online con to do that when I can play with Sean and Deanna whenever I want? Like, I just didn't, I didn't grasp how much a virtual con could feel like. And I gotta say, I'm very happy to say that Renegade Con proved me wrong on this completely. Like, I, it felt, I'm not like I was at a con, but like, I felt like I was attending an event. It felt like something special. It felt like something I couldn't do every day. I got to check out games that I didn't normally get to see. I admit I didn't play any. That, that maybe that's on my next list for the next one I attend. Um, I got to hit up panels. Um, I, I looked at promos, though. I got to admit, this is something I hadn't mentioned yet. One one fault of Renegade Con is the online store was US only. Now, I got to admit that's because of current shipping problems. So I can't really blame Renegade on that, but that part sucked. The dealer hall was like, hey, here's all this stuff you can't have. That kind of sucked. But you know what? Eh, uh, that's all right. I, I think it was neat. And then one thing happened. 
the, the like the first time it happened a couple times, but like the first time this happened, this kind of cinched it for me, right? This is when it switched to feel like a real con. I am sitting in a chat room, Banana Chan's there talking about uh, world building, and I see a name pop up that I recognize. And then I made a comment, and that person's like, hey, Mo, and I'm like, hey, Nate, and we start chatting. I'm like, wait a minute, like here I am on a virtual con, and I just bumped into an old friend, like someone I know only from online. And then later, there was someone I ran into in Origins that I met at Origins last year for the first time ever. We bumped into each other in the chat room on Discord. And I'm like, my God, I ran into con friends at an online con. Like that just... Uh, they said it, it flipped the switch. I'm like, all right, now it feels like a con. I'm like, I'm meeting up with old friends, but digitally. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, after it, it's quite interesting. I've actually been doing uh, uh, one of the companies uh, I work with in my day job does uh, a lot of interesting um, uh, training training things now online. Uh, in this you know age of pandemics, uh, and it's really interesting looking into the Q and A session of these live panels. Uh, and seeing people that I don't actually get to actually see anymore. Uh, and I got a phone call today and someone was like saying, Oh, Hey, I saw your great comment the other day that everyone was, yeah. was responding to on your thing. Uh, and it's very much the same sort of, sort of thing of, of meeting things. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Uh, now we don't know what's happening in the future for online cons. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. Right. Right now though, I, like what this meant to me is, I am looking forward to taking part in other online conventions. I'm not going to discredit them. There's no, no longer in my head is like, oh, they're just doing an online con. I don't want to attend that. No, it's not going to be a real con. It's not going to hold a candle to it. I, I'm going to really miss getting away from the house, right? Like part of the things I love about cons is it's also a vacation. I get out of Windsor. I get to try new food and I get to go out for drinks with some friends and people I haven't seen in years. We're not going to quite get that, but I am really looking forward to, to sitting on more panels on Twitch and sitting in on YouTube and taking part in a chat room and attending a painting workshop where they tell me to, what tools to have and have them in front of me so I can play along and do it at the same time. Like, that's really cool. And what I'd really like to try, the, whatever the next online con I attend is, is to actually play some games, which is the one thing I admit I did skip this time. I didn't get into playing the games. That required more scheduling right i didn't schedule myself this was i was working and i had a couple windows open next time i'm gonna have to make some time to actually play some games yeah I, and for me and again this is you know comes back to what i talked about earlier i really feel like um see now having heard your experiences and and learning from that uh you need you still need to schedule them right yeah if, if we're going to break out con i am gonna go into my calendar and i'm gonna block out three or four days and yeah and, and, and plan that, you know, oh, I can't do this, that, and the other thing because I'm going to be doing breakout con. And I think that needs to be taken into account for these as well because there yeah. really is just that much content. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to be playing a game on BGA. No, no, you're going to sit down at a virtual table with a bunch of people for mm -hmm. X hours or sit through four hours of, you know, talks and, uh, and on Twitch. Uh, mm -hmm. the scheduling needs to be there to make it work uh, efficiently. I agree. Now, just, just for everyone out there listening, uh, just let my experience be a learning experience, right? Don't discredit these online game conventions. Don't give up. Don't think that they can't feel like an actual con. Take the time to check them out and actually take part. They're never going to replace the real thing, right? But it is surprising how much of an actual con experience you can have at a virtual gaming con.